Welcome back, everyone, to our Sunday School series. We are continuing in our unit entitled Staying True in a World Far from God. And today's lesson is entitled Speak Truth Boldly. Being a bold witness for God sometimes means speaking hard truth. Christians are called to stand for truth not just in practice, but verbally. We are called to speak, and many times what we have to say will go against the popular notions of the day. Nevertheless, this is what witnesses for Jesus do. We testify about who God is and about what he says, regardless of how popular that message may be. Let's pray as we begin our lesson today. Heavenly Father, precious, wonderful Lord, our God, thank you, Lord, for your goodness, your grace, your love. Thank you for your word. Thank you for another opportunity to join together, to study and learn and grow, to be changed and challenged by your word. Lord, we just pray that we would hear you speaking to us today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. <clears throat> we are continuing in the book of Daniel. <clears throat> We're going to be in Daniel chapter 5 today, but before we hit the text of the lesson, we need a little bit of background and actually some verses before the text, which starts in verse 13, but we're going to back up just a little bit. First off, Daniel chapter 5 hits the time period about a quarter of a century after King Nebuchadnezzar had passed away. As a matter of fact, it's 23 years after King Nebuchadnezzar had died. Now, remember, King Nebuchadnezzar is the one who led the siege into Jerusalem. Um, he and his armies of Babylon uh, took Jerusalem captive. They deported the people of Judah and Jerusalem to Babylon. Um, and then, of course, he um, had men trained, uh, remember Daniel, and also Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He had them trained for his service and found them to be wiser um, than any of the others. And so that was over 23 years ago when we hit chapter 5. Now, following his death, his son, Evil Maradoc, also known as Amel Marduk, which means servant of Marduk. That's the, the, one of the false gods of the Babylonians. His son ruled the kingdom for two years until he was assassinated. Then a few relatives and descendants of Nebuchadnezzar reigned for short periods. Then a man named Nabonidus um, reigned as part of a conspiracy that overthrew the last of Nebuchadnezzar's descendants, and he assumed the throne in 556 BC. He reigned for 17 years until Babylon was captured by the Medes under Cyrus the Persian. <clears throat> well, King Nebuchadnezzar, or Nebuchadnezzar, I have trouble saying that one, he worshipped the moon god of the Babylonians, um, and he was a, the king of, excuse me, a, a, while the rest of the Babylonians worshipped Marduk, the king of the gods of, of Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar appointed his firstborn son, Belshazzar, as a co-regent. So he was a co-king at the time. Belshazzar was a wicked and morally depraved ruler. Now, depending on one's translation, you may see that it calls Belshazzar the son of Nebuchadnezzar. Well, in the scriptures and in their culture, a lot of times you were called a son when you were a descendant, not necessarily a first son um, or a first line son. They also referred to their father, which could be ancestor, even if it wasn't a direct father. So just to clarify that, um, Belshazzar was not the direct son of Nebuchadnezzar, but Nebuchadnezzar was his father, meaning ancestor, possibly grandfather in this case, um, to be specific. But this, <clears throat> almost 70 years after Daniel was taken into captivity, 
and about 30 years after the last event of chapter 4 is where we pick up the account in chapter 5. So just so we know where we are. Now, we're going, like I said, we're going to cover the first 12 verses of Daniel chapter 5 before we get into the actual text of the lesson, <clears throat> just to get some background and to see where we are. Now, it starts out with King Belshazzar, which we just identified um, as that wicked king of Babylon. And so Daniel chapter 5, verse 1, King Belshazzar gave a great banquet for a thousand of his nobles and drank wine with them. While Belshazzar was drinking his wine, he gave orders to bring in the gold and silver goblets that Nebuchadnezzar, his father or ancestor, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem so that the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines might drink from them. So they brought in the gold goblets that had been taken from the temple of God in Jerusalem and the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines drank from them. As they drank the wine, they praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Suddenly, the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall near the lampstand in the royal palace. The king watched the hand as it wrote. His face turned pale, and he was so frightened that his legs became weak and his knees were knocking. The king summoned the enchanters, astrologers, and diviners. Then he said to these wise men of Babylon, Whoever reads this writing and tells me what it means will be clothed in purple, <clears throat> excuse me, will be clothed in purple and have a gold chain placed around his neck, and he will be made the third highest ruler in the kingdom. Then all the king's wise men came in but they could not read the writing or tell the king what it meant. So King Belshazzar became even more terrified, and his face grew more pale. His nobles were baffled. The queen, or in this case could possibly be the queen mother, the queen, hearing the voices of the king and his nobles, came into the banquet hall. May the king live forever, she said. Don't be alarmed. Don't look so pale. There is a man in your kingdom who has the spirit of the holy gods in him. In the time of your father, he was found to have insight and intelligence and wisdom like that of the gods. Your father, King Nebuchadnezzar, appointed him chief of the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and diviners. He did this because Daniel, whom the king called Belshazzar, was found to have a keen mind and knowledge and understanding, and also the ability to interpret dreams, explain riddles, and solve difficult problems. Call for Daniel, and he will tell you what the writing means. So there's a little bit of the background behind where we enter the picture here with um, Daniel in verse 13. As then it says from in verses 13 through 16, so Daniel was brought before the king, and the king said to him, Are you Daniel, one of the exiles my father the king brought from Judah? I have heard that the spirit of the gods is in you, and that you have insight, intelligence, and understanding wisdom. The wise men and enchanters were brought before me to read this writing and tell me what it means, but they could not explain it. Now I have heard that you are able to give interpretations and to solve difficult problems. If you can read this writing and tell me what it means, you will be clothed in purple and have a gold chain placed around your neck, and you will be made the third highest ruler in the kingdom. <clears throat> so, King Belshazzar has Daniel brought in at the suggestion of his queen or his mother in this case. And he says again, my father, the king, referring to Nebuchadnezzar, again, meaning probably ancestor more than just specific father. Then, not being personally acquainted with Daniel, King Belshazzar stated what he had heard about Daniel. Quite a reputation. He attributed great skills to Daniel, insight, which meant illumination from the gods, in their case, thinking more than one god. <laughs> But in this case, he had illumination from the one true God. 
And he had intelligence, which was not just mere intellect, but the ability to use that intelligence correctly. And extraordinary wisdom, which was supernatural ability to interpret dreams and visions, which Daniel had done previously with King Nebuchadnezzar. <clears throat> and he said he had the ability to solve difficult problems. That word problems there is literally the word knots, K-N-O-T-S. Like we might say, we have a knotty problem to solve. Other possible translations are puzzles, riddles, or enigmas. In other words, <laughs> he had a problem, a, a puzzle, a riddle that he needed Daniel to solve. And he seemed to be the only one in the kingdom who was going to be able to do that. Because <clears throat> remember, his wise men, the wise men of Babylon, they really aren't too wise. That's their serving false gods. <laughs> and they don't have the ability that Daniel did from the one true God. <clears throat> then we get to verse 17. Then Daniel answered the king, You may keep your gifts for yourself and give your rewards to someone else. Nevertheless, I will read the writing for the king and tell him what it means. <clears throat> and then verses 20, uh, excuse me, verses 18 through 21. Your majesty, the most high God, excuse me, I read that wrong. There's a comma in there. Your majesty, the most high God gave your father Nebuchadnezzar sovereignty and greatness and glory and splendor. Because of the high position he gave him, all the nations and peoples of every language dreaded and feared him. Those the king wanted to put to death, he put to death. Those he wanted to spare, he spared. Those he wanted to promote, he promoted. And those he wanted to humble, he humbled. But when his heart became arrogant and hardened with pride, he was deposed from his royal throne and stripped of his glory. He was driven away from people and given the mind of an animal. He lived with the wild donkeys and ate grass like an ox, and his body was drenched with the dew of heaven, until he acknowledged that the Most High God is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and sets over them anyone he wishes. Daniel was reminding Belshazzar of the events that happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. <clears throat> And I was just looking back to see where you can read that. Um, and without looking too far, because I didn't look it up before, um, but it is back there um, in some of the first few chapters of Daniel. Um, if anybody wants to know and can't find it, let me know. I'll, I'll look that up. Um, should have done that beforehand. But he's reminding him of what happened. King Nebuchadnezzar exalted himself, lifted himself up in pride, uh, and not acknowledging the one true God. And God humbled him by making him basically go insane. He had the mind of an animal and he was out in a field eating grass like the ox. Well, when Nebuchadnezzar finally acknowledged God and praised the one true God of heaven, God honored him once again. <clears throat> so Daniel is reminding Belshazzar of that. <clears throat> And then he continues in verse 22, But you, Belshazzar, his son, have not humbled yourself, though you knew all of this. Instead, you have set up yourself against the Lord of heaven. You had the goblets from his temple brought to you, and you and your nobles, your wives and your concubines, drank wine from them. You praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which cannot see or hear or understand. But you did not honor the God who holds in his hand your life and all your ways. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Unlike the Babylonian wise men, Daniel would not interpret the words for personal gain or personal profit. Notice he had said in verse 17, keep the gifts for yourself. <laughs> Give them to somebody else if you want. I don't want them. He was not doing it for personal gain, but to honor and serve the Lord. Even though Daniel had accepted rewards before, in this case, Daniel told the king to keep them and give them to somebody else. Belshazzar, unlike his great predecessor, Nebuchadnezzar, had not humbled himself. 
he never learned from the previous failure. And Daniel says in verse 22 to Belshazzar, he said, you knew all this. Belshazzar knew all about it, all about what had happened to Nebuchadnezzar. And as a matter of fact, based on historical records, Belshazzar was actually there. It wasn't just that he heard about it later. He was there serving in the court of Nebuchadnezzar at the time that this happened to Nebuchadnezzar. So he had no excuse. And then it says, Daniel says in verse 23, you set yourself up. Not only did you not humble yourself, but you lifted yourself up in pride, set yourself up just like King Nebuchadnezzar had done to begin with. That is the opposite of humbling oneself. Literally means to lift oneself up. It refers to haughtiness, self-proclaimed arrogance, presumption, and pride. <clears throat> and then he says, not only did you set yourself up, but you did so against the Lord of heaven. Verse 23. He had purposefully done this against the Lord of heaven by committing sacrilege against him in the use of his holy vessels to worship pagan gods. Now, if you remember, when Nebuchadnezzar besieged Jerusalem, captured Jerusalem, took the, the, the people of Judah and Jerusalem to Babylon as captives, um, they took the articles of all of the treasures out of the temple and took them back to Babylon. And so those articles of the temple have been there in Babylon somewhere, stored or wherever, all this time. And King Belshazzar has those goblets and things brought in there, and that's what they're using. So those items were not just some any old treasure that they got in, in Jerusalem, but these were sacred, holy items from the temple of God. Those items were to be used only specifically for the purposes that God intended them to be used for in the temple by his specific priests for specific uses and only at specific times ordained by God himself. Well, King Belshazzar just flippantly brings them in, drinking wine and partying with them. Um, so that's what Daniel is referring to there. He says, you did not honor <clears throat> the God of heaven. <clears throat> Belshazzar not only had not glorified or honored the true God, he had in fact mocked, dishonored, disgraced, and debased him, who he should have been praising and extolling and revering and honoring and worshiping. In verse 23, <clears throat> it ends with the words, all your ways. He said, but you did not honor the God who holds in his hand, your life, and all your ways. This phrase refers to everything Belshazzar did. It doesn't, it doesn't really indicate a controlling predestination, not that kind of predestination that people think where God predestined it so it had to happen, you didn't have any choice. No, the Bible makes it very clear that God gave us a choice. He always gives us a choice. We can choose right or wrong. We can choose to follow him or to reject him. That's our choice. But God knows the choice we're going to make. God knows all of it before it ever took place. He knew what you were going to do and where you were going to be before you were ever born. <clears throat> he knows that. It's all in his hands. But the Bible also makes it clear that if we will trust him and submit to him, he will direct our path. We can trust him for that. But all of Belshazzar's ways and life was in God's hand. <clears throat> Jeremiah said, Lord, I know that people's labs are not their own. It is not for them to direct their steps. And in Proverbs, in all your ways, submit to him and let God direct the course of our lives. God is there to help us direct us. And all that we are and all that we have is in his hand. And the Bible also tells us, as a matter of fact, that the that the heart of the king is in the hand of God. Every king, God, as we looked at in a couple chapters ago in Daniel, every king God deposes or raises up. He can build them up or he can get rid of them. He is in total control. And Daniel was reminding Belshazzar of that. He should have been praising the one who was in control, but he mocked him and 
and dishonored him. <clears throat> and then, continuing in our last section, verses 24 through 28. Therefore, he sent the hand that wrote the inscription. So God sent that hand to write this inscription as a message to Belshazzar. Continuing in verse 25, this is the inscription that was written, Mene Mene Teko Parson. Here is what these words mean. Mene, God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. Teko, you have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. And Paris, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. <clears throat> now, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing those words correctly, but <clears throat> I think I'm probably getting pretty close. But here's the first word of that message, mene. <clears throat> it's a form of the word to number in the sense of fixing a limit to, like we might say that someone's days are numbered. Daniel informed Belshazzar that the days of his reign were numbered and that the days had actually run out. God had brought it to an end. As a matter of fact, if you read ahead in the story, <clears throat> In verse 30, it says, That very night, Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians, was slain, and Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62, which is part of the rest of the translation here as we get to it. But that very night, this prophecy was fulfilled that Daniel's interpreting from this writing on the wall. So God was bringing his reign to an end. And, of course, it's repeated twice, mene, mene, so possibly to give a little more <clears throat> um, emphasis to the fact, okay? And then the next word is tekel, T-E-K-E-L, which literally means to weigh or to assess. Daniel informed Belshazzar that you have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. On God's scale, Belshazzar did not measure up. When you looked at the, the, the standards of God on one side of the scale and Belshazzar on the other, there was no comparison. He didn't measure up, didn't even come close. And then the last word, Paris. In Daniel's interpretation of the writing, the last word given as Paris, while the inscription is parson, parson is the plural form of Paris. It means to break or to divide. Daniel informed Belshazzar, your kingdom is divided or broken up. But there's a double meaning to the word Paris. The term also is used as a name for the Persians. Thus, Daniel continued to inform Belshazzar that his empire had been given to the Medes and the Persians. And as we just read in verse 30, <clears throat> excuse me, that that very night, the king of the Medes, um, Darius, came in and conquered. All this was prophesied by the prophets of God earlier in Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 13 and chapter 21, and Jeremiah in chapter 51. But Jeremiah even prophesying that Nebuchadnezzar's line would end with his grandson. That's Jeremiah 27, 5 through 7. So all of those prophecies will, were fulfilled right here that very night when the fulfillment of this message on the wall came to be. Point here is this as we sum up. Daniel spoke words that the king certainly did not want to hear, but words of truth that the king needed to hear and probably the rest of his kingdom needed to hear. The people around the king needed to hear this message of truth. You and I, as Christians, as followers of Jesus Christ, we have a message that the world desperately needs to hear. No, they don't always want to hear it. As a matter of fact, they can be and often are adamantly opposed to it. They adamantly reject it. And they will oppose us and reject us as well because of the message. They may even abuse or persecute or put us to death that's going on in the world all around us today and it could happen anytime here 
but the world does not want to hear the truth, but they need to hear it. Let's keep on proclaiming and sharing the truth in love so that they can be saved and go to heaven. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, precious Lord, our God, thank you so much, Lord, for your word of truth. Thank you, Lord, for the understanding that you give to us through your Holy Spirit. Lord, help us to take a stand on the truth. Help us to speak the truth. Help us to share the truth. <clears throat> Excuse me. Lord, help us to continue to speak and to share no matter what opposition that we may face. Lord, help us to share that truth in love so that others can come to know you and be saved. Lord, we thank you and praise you in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. God bless you, and I will see you next time. <laughs>